This video will deal with types of work flexibility. It will look at different approaches to uh, employment of staff and the type of working arrangements that, that they may um, undertake. Now organizations have long understood the importance of flexibility in the workplace and they've identified the connection between organizational performance and flexibility. So it's now on the agenda at least in most business schools and on in business courses that the performance of an organization is linked intricately with the flexibility of its workforce and their ability to uh, multitask where possible but also to uh, pick up the slack when uh, people are away ill or people are on holidays uh, that the organization is able to maintain its presence in the marketplace uh, apparently unaffected by absenteeism or by uh, staff on holidays or whatever. So flexibility has become quite a big issue um, in the journals. Uh, all organizations tend to opt for some form of flexibility. For example, employees are laid off or made redundant when an organization is underperforming. Well, that's a type of flexibility it's not a one we we think of in in pleasant terms because redundancy is never nice but it depends on the the types of contract that the employees had or it depends on the terms of the redundancy but certainly if an organization is going through a bad period then it can't afford to maintain the the workforce perhaps and therefore redundancies are inevitable uh, also, employees are offered overtime pay when the organization is booming. Again, it's a type of flexibility. They're, they're trying to stretch the available resource to cover a peak in demand. And to do it by compensating the, the workers, by paying them perhaps time and a half or double time. Uh, in other words, the hourly rate is doubled if they work uh, extra time. So it's looking for flexibility it's it's attempting to stretch the existing workforce to cover the shortfall of course if the boom period was seen as permanent then the company uh, would take on extra workers uh, rather than pay the existing workers time and a half or double time it would be cheaper to employ additional workers so companies are constantly reviewing flexibility and the possibilities of flexibility within the labor force looking for ways in which the workforce can be engaged on different contracts and engaged to meet booms and slumps in uh, demand for the product. The concept of flexibility has gained considerable interest because Globalization has put it on, on the map. Uh, competition and the rise of e-commerce has resulted in unpredictable markets. So globalization, more intense competition as a consequence of globalization, but also as a consequence of perhaps more company startups, and also the rise in e-commerce and e-business. Uh, all of these have resulted in unpredictable markets. So companies need to have more flexibility. Uh, there is more uncertainty about trading conditions. There are also new technologies and different ways of working. Uh, in some cases they've eliminated the need for employees. Uh, when very powerful applications, for example databases uh, or uh, scheduling uh, uh, programs when, when many, even indeed the, the standard Excel spreadsheet and, and uh, software like that, but when these have come into the, the workforce, it's, it's meant that fewer people are required. Um, but also it means that the existing workforce can operate more flexibly. They, they don't have to work in a particular 
situation. They don't have to work particular hours. Perhaps there's more emphasis on moving from measuring the employee's inputs to measuring the, the employee's outputs. Because the outputs can be achieved anywhere with internet connections and with good software and good computing facilities the workforce are not necessarily tied to their desks. It's also the decline in, in the power of trade unions and this has handed more control to management so management are trying to force through flexibility. The, the unions are less capable of fighting um, because of various pieces of legislation and a fall in numbers uh, who are joining the, the trade union movements. Um, so management have more power and more power to explore flexibility. There's also a changing attitude to work and it's given rise to flexible working practices. Uh, people now will work on Sundays whereas perhaps in the past they wouldn't. Uh, companies may want to have workers for uh, different different patterns of work because the workers are important and the company has compromised and will start perhaps the day at an unusual time unusual compared to what happened say 20, 30, 40 years ago so employees may start work at 11 o'clock in the morning when they have already delivered their, their children to school they may leave at two o'clock so they can collect their children from school and then they may work at home for some period of time and so it's, it's much more flexible the way working arrangements are currently configured and are evolving they're changing all the time there are different types of flexibility that can be adopted by an organization these are functional numerical, temporal, locational and financial and we'll look at these briefly in the coming slides uh, but there are different types of approach to flexibility that organizations may take we'll look at these as I said so we'll start with uh, functional now functional flexibility is based on developing a multi-skilled workforce all workers are competent in carrying out a range of tasks and that contrasts again starkly with what happened in the past when workers had a single task and they worked day in day out on the single task a very boring situation for the workers there was no job enrichment there was no variation in, in the, the type of work um, now there's more emphasis on flexibility where workers can move as I said earlier if, if um, someone is away ill or someone's on holidays or uh, whatever then other members of the workforce can step in and perform those tasks as well so there's flexibility and uh, there are training programs perhaps initiated by management uh, attended by the employees which will equip the employees, as I said earlier, to, to multitask, to be able to, to perform different tasks and to perform these tasks to a high quality. This approach is very common in manufacturing and the service sectors where employees are required to work a range of shifts and duties. Um, it's often the case, for example, people working in restaurants can uh, can lay the table but they can also work the till they can also serve drinks in the bar they can uh, even perhaps cook simple dishes um, the the chefs in some restaurants can cook a variety of dishes not just one dish but a whole variety and there is increasing flexibility in the use of the labor force in manufacturing it's the same, someone may operate a particular machine but later in the day may switch over to a different machine or be able to do perform a different task. There is functional flexibility. Employees are trained with skills that are transferable 
and skills that may be used for career development. There's always been a, a debate about transferable skills and non-transferable skills. Or, organizations in the past were seen as being keen to develop their employees with non-transferable skills so that if the employee left the place of employment they'd find it difficult to find another job because their skills were unique to that particular company. Uh, it was a way almost of locking in the employees. The employees found it difficult <coughs> to change, work, uh, change uh, jobs. Transferable skills are ones which do move, do move with the person. So if the person leaves one organization and joins another, they can use essentially the same skills. So those are transferable. Now, the approaches associated with reducing the number of job descriptions and encouraging team working. And so in team working the members of the team can perform a variety of tasks and they work together to perform those tasks. But also if a worker has got several skills then it's difficult to classify that worker. The job description is vague because the worker can do several particular tasks. So the worker may not be uniquely employed for a particular machine or a particular process. The worker can do several things. So job descriptions, the number of job descriptions has been reduced. And it also encourages team working where, as I said earlier, um, the employees who are working on the teams can step in and help each other and uh, share the responsibility of generating the output. It encourages uh, staff reduction, focuses on job rotation and shift work which reduces the need for staff. Flexibility, uh, if it's certainly if it's optional it's welcomed by the by the labour force, by, by the workforce. If it's enforced or if it's pushed on, on, on the workers, it may be resisted. But by and large, this type of flexibility, this functional flexibility we're talking about, can lead to a reduction in staff, because the staff are able to move seamlessly between one task to the next. Um, it focuses on job rotation, which is actually a good thing, because it enhances the work experience its job enrichment. People find it, it pleasant to work in that environment because, because they're getting a wider variety of experiences. They are human beings and they do need mental stimulation, the need to engage with the work. So job rotation is good. But shift work may be welcome, it depends. It depends on the circumstances and the hours and what has been agreed with the the workforce. The approach allows easy cover for absences as I said earlier. It saves costs for the organization and employees can easily progress to different areas within the organization. So we have job enrichment, employees moving from one part of the organization to the next. We have <coughs> cost savings because uh, skills are passed even between the employees. They see each other performing particular tasks and they'll learn by watching and perhaps learn by doing. But also problems caused by absenteeism, perhaps due to illness or due to holidays, these are easily covered and the organization is able to maintain its presence in the market. Now does numerical flexibility well, numerical flexibility is mainly adopted uh, for the core workers. The, sorry, functional uh, flexibility is for the core workers. And numerical flexibility is concerned with the periphery. Now, this is based on the work of Atkinson. And the Atkinson model is, is made available in separate notes on the course, where you can read up 
what was meant by this. There are some PDFs, for example, and also um, a video pending on this one. But as far as we're concerned here, um, numerical flexibility is concerned with the periphery. Now, what Atkinson med meant by the periphery is these are workers which are not core. They are workers that are required, but which um, uh, are, are, in a sense, more flexibly used. In other words, uh, they they pick up tasks which are more universally uh, understood and more universally uh, doable. In other words, uh, virtually any member of staff could perform these tasks. They're on the periphery of the organization. They're not core, they're not central to the production process. They are performing tasks which are essential, but almost anyone can do them. They're, they're low skilled and they're not uh, fundamental. They, they, they can be picked up by other members of staff and performed as and when required. So they make life easy for the organization. They ensure all of the, the tasks are completed, but these particular tasks are low skilled not completely essential perhaps, um, but can be done as and when required. So in this case the company has numerical flexibility. They may employ the full complement of workers to complete these tasks or from time to time they may uh, fall under that number and try to use other flexible methods to get the existing workforce to perhaps do some overtime or uh, to come in at the weekends or to uh, be flexible about when they can perform the tasks and perhaps pay them something extra for it. The focus on numerical flexibility is on employees on different for forms of atypical contract. So generally speaking the employees in the, this numerical flexibility context have a more atypical type of contract. It, it's not a standard contract. Um, this approach is useful when the organization seeks to employ more workers uh, in a short space of time. So it's uh, when, when the company is trying to recruit workers very fast the contracts are very simple or very straightforward. Uh, they're also not typical long-term contracts. They are perhaps short-term contracts which gives the company the option of reviewing the contract and also gives the employees the option of, of reviewing the contracts and looking at their jobs and looking at uh, what the, the market is paying and gives them the, the flexibility to move on. It gives the organization the flexibility as well to review performance and review what is happening and perhaps uh, uh, identify areas where training is required for some people or, or perhaps the people are not suited to the business whatever or look to to try and get a, a better solution if the workers were not completely satisfactory. Employees are employed on different contracts, usually um, short term, as I said, temporary or even seasonal work, making it easy to lay off staff or terminate contracts when there is no need for the staff. So the company has m much more flexibility in this case. Employers have more control over the number of employees they recruit and the demand for labour. So the employers are able to um, take on some staff, uh, get the get the work done, uh, review which members of staff are working well and have integrated well, and and perhaps either retrain the ones who haven't or lay them off. Contract terms uh, are temporary. There is less emphasis on employee development and training programs generally speaking. It may be that the company uh, is more generous in its, its uh, dealing with the workforce and will offer training. 
but not all will. Um, some may simply decide that the the tasks that are required in this type of with this type of flexibility, the tasks are so straightforward and so basic that training is not needed. And if the employee can't do it, then they're simply not suitable to that sort of employment. Now temporary flexibility. This approach to flexibility focuses on refining total hours uh, of work against labour demand. So it's temporary. It's it focuses on refining the total hours of work against the labour demand. So it, it it works out how many hours work is required and looks at the demand for labour. It's becoming a, a common approach where workers are only paid for the hours they work. So the company uh, tries to work out how many hours work it requires and then tries to find employees who will work for that number of hours. This saves costs for the organisation as they are not paying workers when there's no labour demand. So workers are only required uh, when there is work to be done. Now this means that the company has great flexibility but of course there is a downside here that the workers only can work when the company says so. Well the workers are people, they may have obligations, family obligations for example, and it may not be in their interest to have this type of flexibility. So it's quite a controversial approach. It includes flexi time, zero hour, um, hourly and annual schemes. Um, it's all to the advantage of the employer. It means that <coughs> the employee may be required for a few hours every day, may not be required tomorrow, might be required for a few hours the next day, but it sounds like it's very good in terms of pro productivity and for the uh, long run stability of the business and the ability of the business to compete in the market and so on. It sounds that, which I suppose it is, but it's also not very nice for the employee who may be dependent upon that work to feed his or her family. So there are issues here that need to be thought about. Locational flexibility. This approach refers to using distance strategies to achieve organizational labor demands. This approach is becoming very common as more organizations are opting in project work, freelance, outsourcing from external agencies. Um, what it means in effect is that organizations buy in resources from other agencies, from other companies perhaps. So it's it's similar to outsourcing. They're able to get the work done from other agencies. Um, uh, an employer may, may take on the workforce through an agency. So the agency pays the workers. Now it happens um, quite a lot. It happens with the, the National Health Service in the UK. Uh, many doctors, uh, nurses, uh, so on, may work for agencies and the agency negotiates the pay claim for the for the worker and then pays the worker. The agency of course gets to keep a sum of money for itself. So locational flexibility uh, is is a way in which companies can attempt to save by um, looking at distance strategies, trying to achieve organize to achieve organizational demands. It it may be that it employs from a different town or a different area even and agencies will deliver uh, the workers to the organization to do their work and the agency perhaps will take a sum uh, as its fee and pay the, the workers the remaining part. It gives flexibility but again it's it's quite controversial. So organizations recruit private sector organizations to take on tasks and work needs. 
This reduces costs as tasks are allocated to different businesses. So the organization has less problems with uh, employment contracts and obligations under the law for uh, all sorts of uh, payments and so on. Uh, it may be that the work is conducted on someone else's premises even so that the insurance issues and so on are dealt with by the other company or the other agency. So it's quite cheap for organizations to to buy in in this way and it deals with uh, private sector organizations to take on the tasks uh, and the work needs. Again it sounds like it's more flexibility for the organization but again we have to bear in mind the implications of this for the employees. So it's worth considering this as we work our way through it. Financial flexibility, well the accountancy terms um, flex, uh, financial flexibility is used to describe a company's ability to react to unexpected expenses and investment opportunities. That's what we mean by financial flexibility. The company should be in a position to be able to uh, deal with unexpected uh, expenses. It should have reserves, uh, perhaps retained profits and it should be also have retained profits available in the event of investment opportunities arising. So in this class what we've done is looked at uh, flexibility, we've looked at it from different perspectives. Um, we've looked at functional, uh, we've looked at numerical, um, we've looked at special contracts. Some of it as I said is controversial but one thing for sure, flexibility is on the agenda. It's discussed more and more, it crops up in the literature more and more. There's open discussions about the flexible firm, about the need for flexibility, and there is more emphasis on this as time passes. In addition to that, we have forces, external forces, such as globalization and the advent of modern technologies, which promote the, the use of flexible working conditions and flexibility in the labour market. So that's all we're going to deal with in this class so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.